Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a new weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week, we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week, we'll introduce you to Ruth White, who teaches community education courses on Native American culture at the Leech Lake Tribal College. Alice Blessing of Bemidji shows us how to paint a portrait, but with just her fingertips. And Boyd Bremer of Aiken reenacts what logging camp days used to be like. Hey, my name is Ruth White. I'm the teacher. I've been teaching uh, community um, education for about, what, two years now? And we've been making various uh, uh, articles um, traditionally. Uh, traditional uh, and on the table there there's some beautiful examples of what my students have made. Oh, one has got a prize, first prize at the fair for her basket. These, these are just awesome. It makes your job as a teacher easier when, when people enjoy what they're doing. If you have any problems pulling your thread through your needle, use a, a needle nose. Pick up uh, four, let's see, four beads. Hold on. Just hold on, everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six. Eight beads of one color. Eight. So you got a good knot there, otherwise it's going to go right through. <laughs> okay, now what you're going to do, if you got your eight beads on there, go back. Take your needle back and go to the first bead you put on. Hi, ladies. Go back to the first bead you put on and go backwards. I'll have to go individually and, and help them get started. Make sure that you did it. Make sure so that. There's no bead. And I go oh, you got your center bead in there? No. Oh, that's the way you do it. Okay. Good girl. First, you put a bead on there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, force it into the center. Oh, you put it in the in center. The, in the center. That's your center. And come out uh, at the bead that's sticking up. Okay, put it in the center. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. It's, it's hard at first, but like, all the beading, once you get going, you're okay. They even made their own needles out of uh, bone. I've seen some awesome, they even drilled a little hole in there for the, uh, the sinew. Of course, they didn't have thread till the arrival of the European. They used sinew. And uh, they just threaded their bone needles. I wish I would have uh, brought some of my stuff because I've got bone needles. <laughs> fish hooks, sinew, just everything natural. This was our first, our first, mm-hmm, yeah. Then the birch bark. And then we call this wigwas. You can only get it at a certain time of the year. If you try to get it any other time, you're gonna, um, you're wasting your time because you're gonna wreck the birch bark, and kill the tree or whatever. You have to know just when and how to get it off the tree. You, you know, it's really elusive if you don't have sweet grass growing or you can, can't uh, get a hold of sweet grass uh, or pick any. People do grow it, but they're pretty, they're, they're very possessive with their sweet grass. Um, so that's what we did. We twisted it and um, used porcupine quilts for uh, decoration because uh, that's all they had. They dyed it with natural dyes, you know, such as blue. You could, blueberries, boil blueberries, you get a beautiful blue. 
beets, all beets, you get a beautiful red. Uh, different plants is what they use to dye these. So then we went on and made the basket. These are from a different class that she took, but um, this stuff was our, we, then we um, got into um, loom beading. And these, this is beaded on a loom. We taught them how to bead on a loom like this here. This would be a handle or whatever she wants, but it's beautiful. And uh, then we did, well, we, we learned how to do applique. For instance, this is applique. She would cut this, this part off and she would put it on her regalia or wherever she wanted it. There's an example of applique. There's an example of the loom beading. She went out on her own and made all these keychains. Aren't these beautiful colors? Beautiful. And she made bracelets. Lynn? Or Shirley? Shirley made. You know, how many did you make for Christmas? Thirty-one. Keychains for Christmas. Wow. And uh, then this is my pride and joy. We did these, and uh, I, we had some pictures of some of them. Everybody made one, believe it or not. They just are brand new baby moccasins. These are for every day because she just grabbed a piece of leather and made a pair. Oh, so awesome. And these are the town ones. <laughs> and uh, look at the little basket she made out of sweet grass. And sweet. Um, okay, so we learned the looms, uh, lazy stitch, the applique. Uh, now we're gonna do the earrings. And there's, there's so much that um, they haven't learned yet. I've been beading since I was a little girl. My mom made us make our own headbands and stuff when we started out dancing again. And that's where I learned on a, on a frame. A on a loom. <laughs> and we made our own headbands. Back then we wore headbands. They don't wear them so much anymore. But they had their purpose. It's, it's relaxing for me. And I, I think it's relaxing for the girl. See how quiet it is in here? It's not always like that. <laughs> Once we get going, it just gets silly. But that's good because, you know, it's good to have fun too. Can't be serious all the time. This is Buck. I'm painting this. This was a commission or like an order a friend of mine, an acquaintance, who wants me to paint her dog. This is her favorite dog in the whole world. And um, I do this a lot. I've, I'll paint portraits of people on commission, like people will order a portrait. And I also do pets. <laughs> the paints are not non-toxic. They are toxic and as my painting teacher taught me, your skin is your largest organ, so you have to be careful with it. The reason why I paint with my fingers is because it, it allows me more time to paint rather than getting tools cleaned and switching tools, because if you're using paintbrushes, you have to keep that paintbrush wet. If you're using acrylics, you have to keep it clean. You can't mix all the colors on it. Um, and then you have to switch paintbrushes if you want to switch colors. But for me, I can just grab some color out of a tube and slap it on the painting. And uh, that kind of caters to my impatient nature. I can't go back to brushes now. <laughs> I like it too much. I'm too used to painting with my fingers now. Well, when I was in college, in painting class, I used the brushes, but then I started using the knives and the palettes to really just daub paint on in different ways. And I think that that was just a natural progression to finally where I just dropped the tool and started using my fingers. And this, it feels really natural to me, so I've always stuck with it. I use acrylics, uh, acrylic paints, um, just out of the tube, artist acrylics. If I'm filling an order, 
We'll do an order in about three weeks. I think it's about 20 to 30 hours of painting, and that is for something that's bigger than this one that I'm doing right now. This is this is a smaller one for what I normally do. I've found that I can do them if somebody needs it right away for a birthday present or something. I can do it in one or two weeks if I have to, but I usually like to take my time because I like to be able to look at it and study it for a while. Like I'll let it sit for a couple days and then go back to it and I'll see things that I hadn't seen before. Jeremy, you cannot come up here right now. You have to go away. Do you want to um, close him in my bedroom? Sure. Come on, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy. Go. Go with Ashley. Is it the same here? Yeah. Come on. I haven't come across one that I couldn't do, that I couldn't paint. So if somebody has a photo that they want painted, I can usually successfully paint it um, to where they're pleased and I'm pleased. And the worst lighting is usually a flash, like in a dark room an up-close flash on the face and I've done it I've even one of my ones even one of the paintings for my most recent series was that was like that and I chose it and I managed to pull it off so luckily I haven't had to tell anybody no yet but I do prefer to take my own photos before choosing somebody else's photo there are certain things that I need like certain lighting and um, uh, certain you know facial expressions or something so a lot of it comes down to the lighting though, as far as what would make a good painting. It's really difficult to do my daughter. I've tried to paint her a couple times and it's actually I've never done a successful painting of my husband either. And I think it's because, I don't know why it is. It's because it's like I'm too close. Some people say you're just too close to the subject. To, to be happy with the outcome of the painting. But I like to do pets. They're, uh, they're easy to put a lot of color into. Um, people are more difficult to put color into because you have to get the right colors or else they'll look, you know, they'll look unhealthy or, you know, if you put purple, too much purple, they'll look sick or, you know, it's difficult to get the right colors. But with pets, you can put pretty much any color in there, into their, their picture or their fur and it'll just look um, like more fun. <laughs> I did have a show in Miami, which was a lot of fun. What I've discovered is that when I do exhibitions at galleries, that usually the best part of it is that I end up getting people who want to order portraits from me because then they've seen my work. And then what happened in Miami was I had one show and one woman decided to order portraits of her daughters and then her friend decided, saw them and decided to get portraits too of her kids and then um, that kept me busy for two years <laughs> while in Miami so word of mouth is a big is a very important aspect of my business right now I'm trying to focus on getting into a gallery outside of Bemidji most of my shows have been in Bemidji and I I know that now is the time when I need to focus on diversifying I'm hoping to get into some galleries in, in Minneapolis or St. Paul or just outside of Bemidji, but in Minnesota. Well, this series was fun. I got to choose, by myself, I got to choose all the women who are in it. I was looking for strong women and I don't necessarily know all of them. So I got to choose some of my friends and family for the paintings. I had friends send me photos that they had of women and I chose some of those as well. I let them I let my friends know what I was looking for as far as the lighting goes yeah so I got to choose a wide range of women women I knew and women I didn't know a lot of a couple of them ordered prints which are less expensive than the painting so that that's good and then um, yep I did get a couple offers I've, been, I've found that when people if I'm doing a portrait of somebody for myself if I just say oh can I paint your portrait and then I paint it um, about 50% of the time when they see it, they want it. <laughs> Which I don't think is, um, I don't think it's narcissism. I think it's, maybe it is, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But people love to see a portrait of themselves. I think it's because they can see themselves in a new way because it's so different from real life. I hope it's different from real life. I think I like the reaction that people have when they see it. 
I know that it, I did a good job if somebody cries. <laughs> Because they usually will do, you know, their husband or their wife, or they'll get their kids painted. And uh, I'd never know if they really like it, you know, because they'll be like, oh, that's great. I've, but if they cry, I know that they like it. <laughs> and that's a fun part about it, is being able to, you know, connect with people in that way. Um, portraits are, they really get to people's hearts. And that's fun to be a part of that process, to, to be able to help them get there. Um, I like being able to see something that wasn't here before. It's like this painting is pretty unique in that it, it didn't exist um, before I started it. And now that I've finished it, it's, it's another thing in the world. Hi, I'm Joe Gertie. I'm the uh, head cook here at Camp De La Table Bovee. Uh, we're located on the Mud River just outside of Aiken in the, the winter of 1876-77. Aiken got its start uh, just a few years ago, back in 71, and it's just growing into being a big, booming riverboat town. It's the far most northern port on the Mississippi River. But back in 71, there was an even smaller village that was started. Oh, about 30 miles west of uh, Aiken, and uh, I think they call it Brainerd, but it'll never amount to what Aiken's going to be, because Aiken's a big, booming riverboat town. But the camp got started, uh, oh, last summer, where the uh, timber cruiser was hired to go out and uh, survey off the acreage that we wanted to cut the pine from. And he found this plot that we're cutting this winter. Then along about, oh, the end of August, I came into the area with the swampers and the wood butchers. And the swampers are the men that cut the logging trails through the woods down to the landing here by the camp, by the Mud River, where the logs were brought down and stacked all winter long. And the wood butchers are the men that put up the buildings here in camp, the filer shack, the stable, the cook shanty, the bunkhouse. Well, then along about, well, in November, it starts freezing up. We get six to eight inches of snow, we start hiring on the lumberjacks. And in camp, we have 80 men that uh, we've hired on at Camp De La Table Bay. And uh, I gotta feed those men, plus the men that work here, right here in the camp all winter long, too. The men that we've hired, uh, a good lumberjack will get up to $30 a month. If he's a farmer that comes in off the prairie, if he brings a team of horses with him, he'll get about that much for his team of horses each month. And we have a lot of other positions available here in camp. Uh, uh, we have uh, just a few of them that I'll mention. Uh, we have uh, road monkeys. They're the men that uh, keep the logging trails clear to debris. They get about $25 a month board and bunk. And uh, some of my workers that help me here in the camp are the, they call them cookies. And they make about $25 a month helping me here in the, in the camp. Well, in the winter camp, it gets started, our day gets started, where we have a guy uh, by the name of, we call him the bull cook. And about three o'clock in the morning, he has to get up and he goes and gets all the fires going in all the buildings, goes down to the stable, and uh, he uh, has to feed the livestock. And, and to feed the oxen, uh, he has to feed them oats. But the oxen can't eat raw oats, he has to cook the oats. So we have a big fire pit there with a big kettle, and he fills it with oats, water and he cooks the oats every morning to feed the oxen so therefore we call him the bull cook. Then about four o'clock in the morning he's got to go down to the bunkhouse to get the men up. So he goes down to the bunkhouse and and he opens up the door and and he'll stand there for a moment and uh, these men are all sound asleep all 80 of them and and he's got to get them up so he hollers daylight in the swamp and that was the alarm clock to get the men up this is what the men wore all the time. They wore these uh, day and night, 24 hours a day. As the men are all getting ready down in the bunkhouse, we've been up at four o'clock in the morning down here. I've been here at four o'clock with the cookies and we've been boxing up the dough, getting it ready for breakfast. And uh, about five o'clock, when everything's ready, then I'll uh, step outside and I'll take the old Gabriel here. And I take the Gabriel and I'll step outside and I'll give it a good long blow to tell the men it's time to come up to the cook shanty to eat. 
when they first come into the cook shanty. They do that. Then they go over to the pump over here. And there's only two parts of their body are going to get washed all winter long. That's their face and their hands. Because they got to be clean when they come to Joe Gertie's table. Okay. Well, anyway, they come in to the, and they sit down at the same spot for each meal. And uh, one of the things that we have here in camp, there's a, no talking allowed at all. And uh, the men have 15 minutes to eat. And they have to eat as much food as they can and because uh, they have to keep their strength up, you know, because cutting down that pine is, is hard work. And uh, plus there's a lot of different nationalities in camp and they end up getting in fights and, you know, we just can't have that, you know. So, But we got to get them into the cook shanty, we got to get them set down, got to get them to eat. Um, if they've cleaned up their plate and they, they're still time to eat, they uh, simply uh, take their plate and they'll hold it above their head like that and the hash slinger will come along and jerk some more hash onto their plate for them and they can keep right on eating. So the men have to, they get up and they go down to the filer shack and get their ax and saw and they have to be out and have the first pine coming down by daybreak. So that's how our day got started. Well, here's our menu that we had for this morning. On the breakfast menu, we had sweat pads, pork hash, cackleberries, and lagerberries. Sweat pads are, or blankets we call them, those are pancakes with a generous amount of black strap they pour onto the sweat pads. And pork hash and cackleberries are eggs and uh, lagerberries. Uh, we make sure the men eat their lagerberries with every meal because the diet is so heavy in starch, you know, and we can't have the men sick bound up in their bunk. They have to be out cutting down the pine. So I make sure they eat their lagerberries with every meal. That's how our morning got started. The men are out cutting down the pine right now. And so we're boxing up the dough for what we call the noon flagons. We're gonna have bull whip, which is a boiled beef, and Murphy's, which are a potato. Uh, dough god, that's, uh, this is what we call dough god. It's the camp bread, you know. We have that. And uh, along with, like I said, lagerberries. To get the food out to the men though, we have a, a little sleigh, horse-drawn sleigh with a big box on it. We call the swing dangle. And the cookies pack all the food into the swing dangle and then they carry it out to the men to the dinner hole where they're cutting down the pine. And then for supper tonight, we're going to have uh, bird's eye tenderloin. And this is one of the favorites for the men. Uh, we had an oxen go down the other day and we butchered it out and still has the mark of the bullwhacker's goat on it, but that doesn't bother the men any. And then we're gonna have Murphy's, and which are potatoes, and firecrackers. Firecrackers are one of the favorites for the men. Or flannel lifters, those are beans, okay. And then uh, we're also gonna have a shoe pack pie. That's one of the favorite pies the men like. It's made of vinegar and cornstarch, sugar and water, and it's flavored, flavored with vanilla or lemon extract. And then also for tonight, uh, we're also gonna have fish eggs and bear paws. And uh, fish eggs is a tapioca pudding, and bear paws are, it's a large cookie that I make, so. And then, of course, lagerberries. And with each meal, again, it's Scandahoovian blackjack and lye to wash everything down with, so. That's what we're gonna have on the menu for tonight. But that's generally how life is here in the winter camp, at Camp De La Table Bay. And then around the uh, oh, middle of April, when the ice goes out and the rivers open up, then the men, they roll all the logs into the mud river and they have to be floated down the river to the Mississippi. Now, the men usually get paid for winter camp and uh, some of the men will, they go into Aiken and they're broke in a week. And uh, they, uh, so they usually then will hire on to be what we call a river rat or a river pig to float the logs down the river. And uh, we float them all the way down to the sawmills in Minneapolis. It's 320 miles from the rapids down to the sawmill in Minneapolis. It takes us about 40 days. We make about eight miles a day. And, uh, but that's the life of the, of the logger. So that's what, uh, how things have started here at Camp De La Table Bay. And, uh, it's been a great pleasure working for the company and uh, good work for me and I've really enjoyed it these many years. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground.
If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 2-1-8-3-3-3-0-2-0. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.